We already have some people logging in right now. With uh, James, the astrophotographer, Book Davies, Mick Whitaker, and Mike Wiesner. These guys kind of alternate uh, who's, who's usually first on the live chats. <laughs> Good, good audience we have. This is Pekka uh, Hatala logging on. He's from uh, Stockholm, Sweden. We've got Cameron Gillis from Seattle. Mick Whitaker is on. I think Mick's from, is that right, Mick? Are you from the UK? I was thinking so. Uh, Book Davy says, got my 62 degree eyepieces yesterday just after the show. They are fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Richard Grace is on. Um, saying hello. Uh, you're getting a shout out from James, the astrophotographer. He says, uh, hello, everyone. Um, yep, yeah, Mick says he's from the UK. We already got, we already have a worldwide audience. <laughs> Mike Wiesner says, we are Scott's groupies. <laughs> I'm your groupie, Mike. Pekka says they're the stalkers, not the groupies. <laughs> Alan Dyer's on. Greetings from Calgary, Canada. Hi to Bill and Ian. Break a leg. <laughs> Say hi back to Alan on, for Alan? us. What's that? Say hi back to Alan for us. Yeah, he can hear you. He can hear you. Alan. Hi, Alan. Yeah. Yeah, Alan's a legendary astronomer. Great, great astrophotographer. One of, yeah. the, one of the one of the very best. Yes. Jim Norwood's on. I know where he parks his trailer too. Creepy. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> I will say what's kind of strange is if when you the next time I can actually go to an event, okay, which is probably going to happen sometime this year. Um, sometimes you're at an event and people walk up to you as if they know you, you know. Uh -huh. Hi, Scott, how are you? <laughs> hi. <laughs> oh, hi. How are you? <laughs> yeah. Wajdi says hello to both of you. That's great. Alan says, we're hearing you. Careful what you say. I just finished a live webcast about the Aurora with the RESC. Yeah, we know we're live, Alan. And yes, we've made every possible mistake you can in live streaming. So I already warned Bill and Ian about this. So. Carol Locke says hello and good afternoon.
I used to have everybody silence their mics before, you know, for the countdown before a show, but I find that the audience kind of likes to hear the background chatter. So, mm. yeah. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is um, Scott Roberts with the Explore Alliance on, and an Explore Now program with Ian McLennan and Bill Peters of Ian McLennan Consulting. Uh, these guys are known worldwide uh, for their amazing work with museums, science centers, planetariums, uh, historic observatories, um, and it's something they've been at for a long time. Uh, uh, they are, uh, you know, highly respected. When you when you are uh, when you get involved with uh, a little bit with some of the, uh, uh, you know, the organizational people that are involved in trying to make these really complex uh, science programs or projects that they have, you know, to become a reality, like a, a new, um, uh, you know, outreach center or how to revive and revamp an aging observatory. Um, you know, these guys are, they are the go-to guys. And uh, so if you, if you manage, if, if any of you are planetarium people or a science museum people or, or anyone involved in that kind of uh, educational, you know, science-centered kind of work, these are the guys that you want to uh, talk to. Um, Ian and Bill, thank you so much for coming on to our program. Um, <laughs> uh, good, to be, good to be with you, Scott. Yes, I, um, you know, I met you, I met, uh, I didn't get to meet you, Bill, um, uh, uh, when we did the uh, meeting with the Alliance of Historic Observatories. It was our first meeting that we had at Mount Wilson, but you were, you were well spoken of uh, at this, uh, at this meeting, uh, you know, but uh Instantly became uh, uh, friends with uh, Ian McLennan. Really thought, you know, he was, uh, uh, you know, kind of this reserved guy and everything. And uh, amongst these iconic uh, astronomers that were there um, and, and directors of observatories and stuff. And I, I immediately realized that Ian is uh, uh, really a, an intelligent guy and. Uh, um, I, I didn't know much about him at the time, but uh, I've, and I've learned just a little bit more about him uh, over the last couple of years. But uh, you are you you've been very very involved with planetariums. I know that uh, you are um, uh, you got uh, both of you have been involved with uh, Lowell Observatory, Yerkes Observatory, uh, perhaps um, the Very Large Array. I don't know if both of you worked mm -hmm. on that or not. But, uh, yeah, I did uh, some work on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Royal British Columbia Museum. Uh, so that, uh, I think these are just a few of the things that you've worked on together. Um, here in Arkansas, uh, there is a group called NWA Space that uh, was lucky enough to uh, save a 24 inch historic Brashear refractor. This is a 1910, Refractor, Explore Scientific, uh, chipped in to help move it from Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's it's now in storage out here, but we're working on a uh, multi-million dollar uh, science museum. And uh, Bill and Ian are uh, guiding this group uh, to learn how to um, raise the money and to approach the community in the way that they need to, to make it a reality. So. I think that kind of gives a, a quick synopsis of, uh, of who you two are. But uh, uh, Ian, why don't we start with you and maybe you can tell more about yourself and um, uh, you know, kind of what inspired, I mean, you guys have very unique jobs, I think. Uh, I don't know if there's a lot of, of people doing what you do, um, but uh, maybe you can uh, help the audience understand more. Yeah. There are a, f a few people who call themselves consultants, but a lot of them are actually salespeople who uh, are very knowledgeable, but they, uh, they have uh, products they want to sell uh, either in the planetarium field or in the astronomy education field in general. So uh, 
uh, Bill and I are among a, a, a very small group of uh, uh, consultants who are not associated with any supply companies hmm. who, uh, who uh, like to present ourselves as, as offering objective, completely objective uh, advice. So, um, but I, I will um, pick up on that and share um, my background if, if you like, uh, and then Bill will do the, the same thing. Um, and um, we'll, we'll start with, uh, can you see the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium? Yeah, and we see it. If you want to go into presentation mode, you can, um, and uh, it'll take it full screen. Okay. There you go. All right. Very nice. So um, my career in this business started uh, at the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium at Edmonton. That was the Canada's first public planetarium. Oh. And it was built to honor the Queen's visit to, to Edmonton the year before. I came out of the broadcasting business. I had uh, been a news film presenter uh, at uh, CFRN TV in Edmonton, working with, uh, among other things, David Roger who subsequently became the director of the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium and then director of the planetarium in Vancouver. I moved to Rochester, New York to establish the Strassenburg Planetarium as part of the Rochester Museum and Science Center. And uh, we had made all, every mistake in the book in Edmonton and we had the opportunity in Rochester to correct those mistakes. And in fact, to go further to introduce some innovative new ideas and uh, I think it's well documented that there were, there were over a hundred innovative uh, possibilities that were realized in the Strassenburg Planetarium. It became the gold standard for, for standard kind of planetariums for uh, at least a, a couple of generations after that. I came back to Canada in the early 1970s and became the first general manager of Ontario Place in Toronto and that uh, was a large, almost like a permanent world expo with the world's first IMAX theater, the first per permanent IMAX theater, a whole series of uh, pods designed by Eb Zeidler. And there was a presentation theater, a, a performing arts theater, a children's village and uh, restaurants and boutiques. Wow. And uh, it, it, it was just a, an amazing, amazing operation. But, uh, but a lot of that centered around the, the world's first IMAX theater. I was attracted to Vancouver in advance of Expo 86, uh, an, an event that changed Vancouver completely. We were uh, uh, kind of an overgrown village before then, but uh, we became a real city as a consequence of Expo 86. This was the preview center, another IMAX or Omnimax theater that was designed to promote the idea of Expo prior to 1986. And then for the exposition itself, I, I was the production manager and the, the uh, deputy commissioner general of the United Nations Pavilion. And among other wow. things, we produced special programs in there that looked at the earth from space. So that tied a lot of the things together. Uh, my partner at the time and I were invited to go to Brisbane, Australia, to do the same thing in uh, Brisbane at the Expo 88. And uh, we uh, constricted the services of Ken Doan, the most famous artist in Australia, to work with us. And he's since become a UNICEF ambassador and uh, has raised millions of dollars for UNICEF as a direct consequence of World Expo 88 and our work with him. I came back to uh, Vancouver in 1990 and set up a consulting practice. And uh, one of my first clients was Griffith Observatory in uh, Los Angeles. And I had actually written a report much earlier in the 1980s uh, detailing the possibilities for revamping the Griffith. And uh, that was a project that was finally realized in the mid 1990s. And uh, as almost everybody knows, uh, the results are an amazing underground facility. We didn't want to disturb the architectural purity of the building. Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, in a whole new theater complex and uh, everything else. It was just a, a wonderful operation working with Ed Krupp there. Right. I did, did some work at Mauna Kea in Hawaii as well as part of my consulting practice. Uh, was 
where the observatories are located, but they, they, they can't handle visitors very well at the top of the mountain. And so we built a, an astronomy discovery center uh, in Hilo, the, the main city on the big island of Hawaii. And I was the consultant on that project, working with uh, Aldrich Pears, a Vancouver design outfit, and uh, Juan Tanis, uh, who works with us now. And among other things, we designed the world's first 3D stereo planetarium uh, that was introduced. In that. And, and the night that we opened that theater was the night that Mercury Messenger went by the planet Mercury. And half an hour after the images came in, they were in our show. Wow. I also did some work with the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, uh, working with the Peter Harrison Planetarium there, working with uh, Kevin Fuster, the director of the Royal uh, Greenwich uh, Maritime Museum. And uh, I got to know him uh, previously, but working with him at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, Australia, where he was trying to get a uh, planetarium built in Sydney. Um, worked with uh, Denis Simopoulos in Athens, Greece, and uh, there that was the first, uh, one of the first times that I got to meet with uh, Bill Chomick, and both Bill Peters and I have worked uh, often and regularly with Bill Chomick on a number of projects, but we worked on the Eugenitas Foundation Planetarium in Athens, and that was a, an amazing project. I could write an opera about that one. Yeah. Closer to home, uh, I was a consultant on the Planetarium de Montreal, um, uh, an amazing uh, project where we built two domes, one for art expression and the other for pure astronomy. And uh, it's just a, a, a wonderful planetarium with, uh, it's just been uh, doing great business. Of course, everything is interrupted because of COVID, but um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful design, Cardin uh, Architects. Um, I also started working on the Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, and Bill and I have worked together on that. So Bill and I will talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. And uh, Bill and I have also been working in Flagstaff, Arizona uh, on the uh, uh, Lowell Observatory, uh, which was established by Percival Lowell to observe the opposition of Mars in 1896. And that's, of course, where Pluto was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh. And both Bill and I have stayed in Clyde Tombaugh's apartment. So we uh, wow. have been working together on that uh, project with uh, Kevin Schindler, uh, historian. And uh, you can see here, Juan Tanis, our design consultant, a guru, and, uh, and Bill uh, at a planisphere designed by, uh, by ourselves with, uh, with a company in Seattle. And uh, re recently we uh, opened, just before COVID, the uh, Geo Valley Open Deck Observatory, which uh, uh, Bill will expand upon, but that was phase one of a major master plan that uh, has a, a number of uh, dimensions to it that uh, we'll be able to expand upon in, in a few moments. So I'm going to send it back to, to you. Um, I'll stop share. All right. And, uh, wow. Yeah, I mean, all those places are just so, <laughs> many of them so iconic. And uh, uh, I've been to a few of them. I've been to Mauna Kea. I've been to, uh, of course, Griffith and uh, Yerkes and uh, Mount Wilson. Uh, but there's several others I would definitely like to uh, uh, check out if, um, you know, certainly not, you know, the World Fair experience. Those things in general are, are, are really amazing. Um, um, I attended a couple when I was very young. Uh, I don't know if they're so popular anymore, but uh, um, World Expo, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, World there's Expos. A, yeah, yeah, there's a big one happening uh, next year in Dubai. Um, okay. the, the, the one in uh, Shanghai in 2010, I was involved with that, and that was uh, huge. It was a huge exposition. Wow. Um, so there, so there, much goes into the, those, oh, those uh, expos. They, they are amazing, uh, amazing events. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So that was just skimming the surface. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll switch over to Bill. Um, okay, and, Bill. Uh, um, you know, and then we'll we'll come back and talk to both of you about uh, yeah. some of your well, Bill and I have worked. And, 
Bill and I have worked together on a, for a number of years on a number of projects, but we, we worked together in the Griffith Observatory. I meant to mention that. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Excellent. Okay, uh, uh, Scott, I'll share my, uh, my screen here and we can take a little uh, tour of uh, uh, some additional uh, projects. Uh, uh -huh. There we go. Let me uh, get this changing slides here. Someone has a question for you, Ian. They want to know if you've visited the observatory in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, I know the science center there, but not the observatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, likewise, I'm very familiar with uh, uh, Heureka, which, um, uh, uh, and I visited it uh, prior to uh, working on the planning for the Telespark Science Center in, uh, in Calgary and the Heureka Science Center in just outside of uh, Helsinki was uh, uh, very influential in our are thinking this is um, uh, tell us uh, spark. Uh, uh, my career started in the uh, in the planetarium field, uh, producing planetarium shows, then directing uh, planetariums, uh, then moving into administration and running museums and uh, and science centers, and that uh, culminated when I was uh, president and CEO of the Calgary Science Center Society and. Um, led the planning for a new $150 million uh, science center in Calgary that opened a decade ago. Uh, it's, uh, and it's called, of course, uh, uh, Telespark. And it's a delightful place. And uh, while the building is, uh, is wonderful, what I'm really interested in, and Ian as well, is we're interested in how informal learning experiences, whether they happen in a science center, a museum, or at an observatory, or at a world's expo, really have a, a chance to transform people's lives, transform the way people uh, uh, think, and uh, transform uh, people's idea of uh, the, the kind of education that they can go for and, uh, and really get, really transform their view of where they can go in life. So uh, uh, scroll forward a decade, and uh, here's uh, uh, Bill uh, Chomik, the architect and one of the senior managers at uh, Telespark, and we're in the Dome Theater. And uh, now already it's time to renew the seating and the projection and the whole look and feel of the theater. So that's a project that we're in the, uh, in the middle of right now. I should mention that uh, Bill Chomick designed a uh, dome theater uh, for me in uh, Calgary, oh, in the, uh, in the mid 1990s. And it's now the uh, contemporary Calgary dome in an art uh, museum. It's recently been refurbished, but um, it started uh, Bill on his uh, career as an architect of designing domes. and. He's designed dome theaters all over the world, and uh, we added it up a while ago, and uh, Bill has done the design work on more dome theaters than any living architect. Wow. So, and it's just a delight to work with him. He has a, a wonderful 3D ability in his mind to see these theaters. Uh, in addition to science centers and planetariums and uh, expos, uh, Ian and I um, uh, do more conventional museums and a project that we've both been deeply involved in over a long period of time is the Museum of North Vancouver, now, now called MANOVA, and it's uh, going to open in 2024, so we're uh, really excited to come out of the pandemic and see this uh, delightful brand new civic uh, museum on its way. Uh, Ian mentioned that we're working with the Vatican Observatory Foundation and uh, uh, we're not uh, planning to bring about any large physical transformations with them, but they needed a new uh, strategic plan for their future and to look at their outreach and to look at their fund uh, development. They have two branches. The last slide was at Castle Gandolfo near uh, Rome, which is their original observatory. And they also have the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope on uh, Mount Graham at um, an altitude of over 11,000 square feet, not too far from Tucson, Arizona. And yes, as you can see in that picture, if you're high enough in Arizona, boy, it gets really cold and it snows. 
Yes. And uh, this is uh, not uh, a terribly uh, large telescope. It's 1.8 uh, meters, but it's a tremendously clever telescope. And uh, they just, uh, the Vatican astronomers, Jesuit astronomers do some amazing work with this. So uh, we're, we're just thrilled to be working with them and uh, helping their project on the way. Ian mentioned Yerkes Observatory and he had this nice sunny picture. Well, in all the trips I've been to Yerkes, I've never been there in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> so the Yerkes people keep uh, um, uh, pr promising to have me back when, uh, when Williams Bay, the lake that you can, and Lake Geneva that you uh, <laughs> can perhaps glimpse just beyond the tree line isn't frozen with little fishing huts all oh, over. Solid. <laughs> I, I mentioned in one of the planning sessions, the, 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 the fireflies are really beautiful in August and Bill looked at me as if I was crazy. <laughs> uh, but many of these uh, historic institutions that have really served their uh, scientific research uh, purposes, your keys is uh, done though, it has equipment capable of, of some level of uh, astronomical research today do have an opportunity to uh, really pivot and uh, pivot into that public education mode so that they can play a role in this transformative learning that, uh, uh, that Ian and I are all about. And this is of course the 40 inch brake refractor, um, the largest uh, operational refractor in the uh, world, just a truly amazing uh, telescope. The University of Chicago has uh, recently turned uh, Yerkes Observatory over to the Yerkes Future Foundation. And um, the foundation is busily driving forward a plan to uh, refurbish this wonderful telescope and uh, repurpose the observatory for public education while keeping uh, a pretty strong science research uh, theme there as well. Uh, moving over to Lowell Observatory, uh, uh, before Ian and I came onto the project there, the uh, Lowell team had done an absolutely phenomenal job of uh, refur refurbishing uh, Percival Lowell's 24 inch refactor. And I had the delightful opportunity uh, at not the most recent opposition of Mars, but the prior one to spend about an hour looking at Mars and Saturn through this, uh, this telescope. And it is truly a wonderful telescope. We can see why uh, Percival Lowell got so excited about what he could, uh, what he could see through it. Um, uh, I've never had views through any other telescope that's, uh, that's quite like this one. Yes, it has uh, chromatic aberration to die for. I know we live in an APO world. <laughs> and Scott, I know you're selling APO telescopes by the truckload. I sell both. I sell both. But um, uh, a fine acromat like this is uh, capable of giving wonderful views. And, and the neat thing about it is that it's open to the public. You can go to Lowell Observatory and uh, uh, you can look at some amazing objects through Percival Lowell's telescope. And as uh, uh, Ian uh, showed, uh, sometimes uh, they will take you down to the uh, plate archives. And uh, uh, if they really like you, they will pull the Pluto discovery plate and show it to you. Wow. Actually, there's more than one Pluto discovery plate because, of course, Clyde Tombaugh had to take a, uh, a series of photos uh, with the Pluto telescope in order to identify the motion of the planet. But this is, uh, this is one of the discovery plates with Clyde's original handwriting writing on the cover sheet. And before you go off this slide, uh, that this is showing uh, both Kevin and uh, Samantha Gorney, who is the Deputy Director for Science Education at Lowell Observatory. Yeah, Samantha's heading up the, their huge public education project and Kevin Schindler, who's carefully holding the plate in his gloved uh, uh, hands, is their historian. And I, I got to tell you, my heart was in my throat when he pulled this plate. I thought, how can they just pull the plate out of the archives and hold it there? <laughs> yeah, somewhat priceless. Uh, so uh, uh, Ian's already mentioned the Gia Valley Open uh, Deck Observatory, and um, uh, I'll talk about it a little because, uh, you know, I, I know there are a lot of amateur astronomers and probably a few uh, professionals uh, 
uh, listening. And we really took a, a unique approach um, uh, to the Gia Valley uh, Observatory. And uh, uh, here's the observing uh, deck and you can see the building on the right. Well, that whole building rolls back on rails, leave, leaving an absolutely smooth um, uh, uh, plaza. And even the trip hazard of the rails is taken care of by a piece of flexible uh, rubber that fills in after the observatory moves out of the way. Hmm. And one of the things we found that was truly wonderful about Lowell Observatory was to stand there at night and experience the whole dome of the sky, not looking up through the slit of a building, not surrounded by the walls of the observatory, but just be out on uh, top of the mountain, on top of Mars Hill, and experience the dome of night all around. Hmm. So uh, part of being a planner is to make sure you get things right. And uh, uh, long before the heavy equipment showed up on uh, Mars Hill, we had a concept for the observatory and there's Jim Cole on the left and Sarah Bircher with her arms uh, extended. And uh, we're moving portable telescopes all around the plaza with the red barriers there outlining uh, uh, where the uh, walls of the observatory might go to really understand the possible placement of telescopes, how people needed to move among them. And uh, this little exercise was immensely valuable and really helped inform the architecture of the building. So uh, there's an awful lot of steps that go into uh, uh, planning a successful venue. And uh, We'll see how this uh, streams. Here we can see the, um, uh, the Gia Valley building uh, moving back. Uh, the donor on this, Ginger Gia Valley, Ginger and John v Gia Valley, the donors were wonderful. And uh, uh, Ginger was so dedicated to the project. She attended most of the planning meetings and a very community connected person. So she helped fill in a lot of that community knowledge that really informed this. and. Uh, made it a great project. Those are a couple of plane wave uh, telescopes at the back. Mm -hmm. uh, in the front, just over at the right, uh, there is a star structure 32-inch uh, telescope, the largest on Mars Hill. And another advantage of rolling the building uh, back is it makes it e uh, real easy to um, point low-slung Dobsonian telescopes almost right down to the horizon. It looks beautiful. It, it really does. Just the whole so thing. this is simply phase one of a project uh, that will utterly transform Mars uh, Hill. Percival Lowell, uh, if he were to pop back, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't believe his eyes. Um, Although he did stipulate uh, in, in his deed of gift that he wanted uh, the observatory forever to deal with both leading edge research and public education. And so the observatory has respected that ever since then. And that's a, a very unique uh, a, a dual mission. One of my first days at Lowell Observatory, the um, uh, per, um, Lowell Putnam, the great grandnephew of Percival Lowell, uh, literally grabbed me by the arm and dragged me into the rotunda gallery where they have this dual mission etched in metal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how important it is uh, to the observatory. So right now we're in the final stages of uh, uh, planning the um, Marley Foundation Astronomy Discovery Center. And uh, this will have a number of unique uh, features. And I'm going to take you on a little flyover that will uh, show you perhaps the most uh, uh, unique of these. We're going to fly right over the, um, the model here. This is intended to be opened in uh, 2023 on Percival Lowell's birthday, hopefully. And we're just flying over the dark sky planetarium. It's open to the air? It's open to the air. There's no dome. There's a real planetarium with heated seats but uh, no, and, and some yeah. screens for projection, but uh, no dome. It's the real sky. The stars and uh, so this is what it'll be like to uh, uh, sit in the, um, uh, in the dark sky planetarium at, uh, at Lowell Observatory. 
and we see it being used for some daytime uh, uh, programming, but the, uh, the main focus of the um, dark sky planetarium will uh, be at night. There will be audio visual uh, um, uh, support, but uh, mainly just one of uh, Lowell's wonderful educators. Uh, Lowell has great people that just enthrall audiences and this will be a, uh, just a great venue for the uh, presenter with the green laser pointer to uh, connect people with the night sky. Inside the uh, Astronomy Discovery Center, there's going to be a unique uh, theater, the uh, Lowell Universe Theater. And rather than a dome, uh, it'll have a big uh, cylindrical screen that will surround the audience. And it'll take people uh, places like to the Lowell uh, Discovery uh, Telescope, out in space, uh, to the discoveries that Lowell astronomers are making. Uh, just about anything you imagine. And it'll have the uh, a unique circular screen above the uh, large uh, cylindrical screen. So truly a unique immersive theater. Hmm. In addition, there's going to be uh, uh, two exhibit halls. Um, the Lowell educators uh, uh, realized uh, equally with Ian and I, the people start their journey of learning at a very young age and very often the ideas and experiences you have uh, when you're tiny frame your attitudes towards learning throughout your entire life. And uh, uh, so there's going to be a, a children's gallery. It's been uh, given a name now. It's the Orbits Gallery. And uh, uh, now we're beginning to see some of the detailed uh, planning emerge and uh, Here's Marzi's uh, playground. That's uh, Marzi, the yellow uh, Martian uh, there. And uh, this is the um, play learning area just for crawlers. And here's some of the uh, play learning facilities for kids that are a bit older. Very cool. Uh, there will be an astronomy uh, gallery, which is a more um, of a, a family-oriented venue, a peoples of all age uh, uh, venue, but really designed to pick up where the kids gallery leaves off and continue the uh, journey of learning. And this uh, uh, gallery takes you from gas and dust to life. So uh, a very unique, very experiential, um, very interactive. While the theme is, uh, is astronomy, the Astronomy Discovery Center will um, truly be a Northern Arizona Science Center. And that's my slide set. Excellent, Bill. I mean, these, these new places just look like um, uh, things that will absolutely create this transformative experience uh, that you're talking about. And I think all of us that are watching and certainly those of us that are on this broadcast, we get uh, how this transformation uh, can be so important, but you guys- I might, I might, just, mention, I might just mention, Scott, that um, when, when we began the, the planning with Lowell, it wasn't our intention to, to, to <laughs> have all of these things. Their, their original idea was, uh, let's build a, a nice small planetarium to augment our existing uh, uh, programs and offerings. And, um, and whilst we didn't come in with any other agenda, uh, we, we workshop with them about all of the various possibilities and the challenges and the audiences and the community needs and, and all of those things. And gradually over time, this thing has evolved. So it's an important concept that, uh, that, the, that this has actually evolved over the last two or three years. It wasn't uh, something that we just landed, uh, you know, but I, get a, I get a sense of what you and Bill do. I mean, aside from all the other talents that you guys have, whether it's going to be arch architecture or, or uh, programs or, you know, um, you know, raising money, uh, these things, it seems to me that you're able to read the communities that these institutions serve and update and communicate that back to uh, the, the, the organizers or the people behind these institutions to say, look, this is, these are, this is, this is where this community is going. These are 
These are the needs that are there. This is where the money is. This is where this this is what's going to make this community a better community. Um, uh, you know, in, in in some of the process that you've gone through with uh, uh, NWA space, I've, I've you know been able to observe some of that, and I think that's fantastic. I mean, I don't think that there's probably uh, very many. Uh, uh, many others that would come in with all of your insight, okay, uh, that you bring to the table for a program like this. I mean, how else would uh, something like this explode at uh, Lowell Observatory when they said, look, we just want to do this, we want to improve that, and now we've got this, this uh, Giovanni Center, we've got this transformed uh, astronomy uh, discovery center, uh, with all these amazing uh, exhibits and all of that, um, uh, you know, but how, 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 do you, how do you think that this prepares the community that they serve? How do you think it prepares uh, that community's um, youngsters for the future? I mean, our future today, you know, uh, I'm, I'm someone that follows... Uh, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, you know and and just technology in general I find it fascinating but I also wonder what what our world is going to be like and how our our young people and even older people are going to be at all prepared for a, a uh, for a world that is where AI is everywhere well that's, uh, that's a, you go ahead Bill and then I'll, I'll pick up well, uh, one of the people that um, uh, whose research informs our work is uh, John Falk, and he's done uh, an awful lot of work on informal uh, learning. And uh, it's John's uh, contention that uh, people learn 85% of what they know not in school. Hmm. And so providing, uh, and he's in fact the person that really coined or made, at least made popular the uh, term uh, informal learning. And so creating informal learning uh, that really inspires people to uh, get engaged with their own learning, uh, help uh, create people as uh, proactive learners. Who, who don't need uh, so much to be taught as have the motivation to figure things out on their own, to learn more on their own, or to go and find out the teachers that can really help them learn what they need to, uh, to know for the future they imagine is really, really powerful. Uh, you know, most of the people that are changing uh, society today, and Scott, you're one of them, are pretty strongly self-motivated learners. You're equipping people with the tools and the ideas to simply learn more. And so that's what we started doing. Uh, Ian and I went around Flagstaff with the executives from Lowell Observatory, and we talked to dozens and dozens of people, some in small groups, some individually. We talked to civic leaders, to politicians, to educators, uh, occasionally to the celebrated man on the street and just found out what um, uh, people in Flagstaff and region uh, felt they needed for their young people for the future. Mm. And then we helped uh, Lowell Observatory make the decisions how, on how they could deliver uh, some of the pieces of those needs and be part of uh, a really powerful learning ecosystem. And we're doing the same thing now with a number of places, including the Orange Coast College Planetarium in Costa Mesa, uh, California, um, which uh, was opened uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, they, they, they realize that there are some growth po possibilities and opportunities in front of them, and we're helping them there. But uh, part of that is conducting online uh, interviews with community leaders so that we can get a sense of where the community is going. There's one thing that I'll pick up on from what Bill said, mm -hmm. that in addition to the lifelong learning, there's also a great need out there in, in uh, society, certainly North American society, and I think it goes beyond that, uh, to, to enhance uh, society's ability to engage in critical thinking. Right. 
and, and that that's a there's a real deficit in that right now. My own personal aspect of this is informed by my original work as a reporter. I know Kent Martz will do, would uh, appreciate this, um, where you learn to question everything. You just don't uh, you don't accept anything at at face value. Right. And so uh, I think twinning uh, the the enthusiasm of no, uh, and uh, the knowledge uh, experience that a science center or planetarium or a public observatory can bring with programs that, that are specifically designed to get people to question or to look more deeply or to engage in critical thinking, I think is going to be increasingly important in the future. I think so too. I think so too. I think that, um, and, and you know, I think that all of us feel strongly too about the, um, you know, the legacy observatories, the legacy, the iconic um, uh, uh, facilities that yeah. helped establish the field of astrophysics and, and uh, uh, helped us explore the edges of the universe or the, if there is an edge there so <laughs> far so far we just keep finding more yeah. um, uh, but uh, uh, what is the well, what, what, what those what those observatories symbolize uh, was was all the great possibilities and the big thinking that went on at that time right. and, and we we need that more and more now we need big things. Not necessarily that expresses itself in big projects, although that's there's nothing wrong with that when you look at Hadron Collider and, and, and projects like that, LIGO mm -hmm. and so forth. But but um, but but the uh, but they're big they're big ideas. They're they're big questions, and so uh, approaching them with uh, with gusto and with, with commitment and public commitment as well. And of course, an educated public is part of making that possible. That's right. what a science center really should do. I think that while maybe uh, some of these observatories, I mean, uh, let's just take Mount Wilson, for example, uh, in your case would be another one. Uh, you know, they're, in, in, uh, they're not under the, the most ideal skies anymore. Uh, mm. They, uh, but, Walking into them and seeing oh, the, the equipment and everything, oh. the, the feeling of, yeah. of uh, this inspiration, the inspiration hasn't died, okay, right. in, in these facilities. And um, so it's, it's not like it's something that used to be. Uh, in that way, I think that they are very relevant in, in, in today's world. And, uh, and just knowing that they've, they've been, uh, you know, they, they still exist and that they still work and they're still there to serve inspiration, I think is really, really important. And um, so, the, you know, if you are someone that lives in a city where you see a struggling uh, observatory or planetarium, uh, you know, certainly um, I think that it's worthwhile to join them. You know, one of the, uh, the friends of those organizations that help donate money to keep them alive. You have a ton of volunteers that work for these places. Um, it's still lots of work, very specialized work. And then, you know, by helping to encourage them to, uh, you know, either send them letters or, or somehow get involved with their, their organizations to help uh, inspire to do even more, I think is so, so, so critical, you know, and uh, uh, Bill and Ian are, are two of the people that can, that can help unlock the, you know, the, um, uh, the possibilities uh, to, to make it all happen. But what do you two see as some of the biggest obstacles towards getting a, I mean, uh, to, you know, we saw Yerkes almost die completely twice, okay? Um, Mount Wilson has faced these problems. In fact, as, as the universities and the research uh, community moves forward to build ever more elaborate and expensive and capable instruments, uh, they can't always keep feeding money to the legacy instruments. And so uh, they need to make it, they, uh, in my mind, they need to make the transition to serving the public, you know, which, um, uh, you know, you don't know which five-year-old is going to come up to the eyepiece of the Lowell Observatory refractor or the Yerkes refractor or uh, walk through the 100-inch and be completely uh, turned on by, by the experience and have this, 
this imprint that's unforgettable, something that lasts their whole lives. Uh, but but what, are the, what are the main challenges that you run into? Well, uh, as Ian mentioned, uh, uh, we never uh, come in with a hard concept of, uh, of what will be. And I think the main challenge that a lot of organizations uh, face is building that strong connection with the community. Uh, really going out in the community and listening without listening filters, uh, really digging deep to find out what that community needs, what the concerns are in the, uh, uh, in the community, uh, not just around learning and education. Sometimes other things will show up that can be uh, uh, impacted by a visitor uh, serving uh, organization. Uh, and then uh, really crafting a thoughtful response to that. So, uh, you know, I have a degree in astronomy. I have a master's degree in the history of science. Uh, as a consultant, the most valuable training I ever took was uh, a, an active listening short course at the local university. <laughs> Ian comes by this naturally with his uh, skill as a journalist, his ability that I truly admire just to ask good questions and to really dig deep into uh, where the community's at and where it visualizes its collective self going. Mm -hmm. And if you can craft a response to that, that really, uh, that really does capture that, uh, then chances are people are willing to invest in making that happen because they will see the value that that brings to their lives and the lives of everyone else in the community. Right. There's another aspect to that I'll pick up on. And, and if you ask most organizations what their big challenge is, most of them will just say it's money. We, <laughs> we don't have right. enough money. Right. And, and uh, that's, that's a truism uh, because every organization needs money. But if, you, if that's your starting place, then you're, you're not going to go anywhere. Um, you, you have to develop uh, a, a vision and then get the community to buy into that vision and not just selling it to the community as Bill suggests, but uh, bringing the community along and responding to the community. So it, it, it's an iterative, accumulative, uh, evolving process. And, and if you get that going and you get the governance right, um, uh, Bill, Bill is especially strong in this uh, so many organizations start out with a vision. We want to build this and we want to do that. And this is what it'll look like. And we, we've got this star architect. <laughs> um, that, that, that's just not a good starting place. Um, so if, if, you, uh, if you have a, a, a mechanism and a commitment and a process for, for engaging the community in a dialogue so that, uh, that what you eventually present to the community has actually partly come out of that community, mm -hmm. then, then you'll find the resources and that will match the, the, the attention you've paid to the governance. Because if you don't get the governance of an organization right, uh, sooner or later, everything else will, will fall apart. We can guarantee that. And I have seen facilities um and museums of different types that are they're shuttered now they're 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 completely gone and uh um you know and that it always makes me wonder wh why why that might happen um but i think that that you touched on something about uh, the government you know certainly the governance but that vision that you have to have okay that has to carry on not for a 10-year plan or a 20-year plan but like maybe like a century or two century plan, okay? Yeah. Um, which I'm sure that, you know, Percival Lowell himself had, uh, uh, you know, that vision that for hundreds of years that, uh, that this thing would still be going on, you know? Um, uh, how, how, do you, how do you know or how do you teach a group, okay, that, that is on fire about, about building the next museum or planetarium or whatever, what is it that, that you, you can do to make a, this, this thing be sustainable? Because once you burn through the cash, okay, you built the building, you did your initial marketing plan, you did all the things right, the people come and then, okay, the people come and then that's, 
then you you got to get to a point of where if there ain't there isn't more being thought of all the time okay mm -hmm. and the community being cultivated and harvested and fertilized <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it can't go on right well uh, what we like to do is is we think of ourselves as uh, teachers uh, too and we like to equip the organizations that we work with with uh, with some of our skills and um, uh, because it's it's not just listening once and responding. Well, you need to do more than respond. You need to uh, actually come back to the community in some way that not just meets her expectations, but exceeds it. Then you need to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't go and listen for an organization. We listen with an organization. Mm -hmm. And um, to give you an example of a little tiny project we did recently, there was a research institute that we really liked. And the director said, I need a new strategic plan, but I barely have any money. And we said, OK, we'll teach you how to do this. We'll do a couple of little pieces that you can afford, and we'll teach you uh, the rest. Well, the guy's bright and personable, and he picked up our approach. and. Uh, he uh, took our pieces and took the listening we started with him and got some students involved to do more. And I did some stuff with uh, him and I gave him an outline and he filled in his strategic plan and he's on fire. So we were just thrilled that we were able to, uh, uh, to pass on that uh, skill set and get him going. And that'll, that'll serve him and his research institute uh, uh, probably for decades into the future. Excellent. But it is important to uh, to look ahead. Uh, many uh, many people fall into the trap of being excited about getting a new project. Let's build an observatory. Let's build a big planetarium. Let's build the big the, the world's largest whatever. Right. And and then they open it and and there's some excitement at the beginning. But uh, when that initial excitement falls uh, falls away, uh, or the, there isn't enough attention paid to ongoing programming or enough attention paid to the operational fundraising that's needed or the endowment that's needed to sustain this, uh, inevitably it's going to uh, fall apart. And so um, part of what, uh, what our role is in some organizations, if they listen and and frankly, we don't want to organization, <laughs> we don't want to work with organizations that don't listen. Um, if, if they have the listening skills and will, will pay attention, they will set things up so that there will be a proper endowment, there will be a proper amount of attention paid to the ongoing needs. They will understand that there'll be a slump after the second year uh, that's natural. And, and so what do you do about that? I mean, it's, it's perfectly natural. You don't panic. You simply recognize that and plan for it. And uh, so all of these are part of uh, an operational plan that uh, is just as important as the capital uh, plan, as exciting as the capital plan is, it's much more important to have uh, a broader vision and plan that uh, carries you forward. I agree, I agree. Uh, there is so much more that I wanna ask you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, I wanted to get into like your your early inspiration and and, and those types of things, but maybe that's uh, that's for a, a another another uh, a time on 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 this uh, program. Uh, but uh, l let's look ahead towards uh, uh, what you guys have on the horizon right now. Um, what what what, uh, what what is on your plate, and uh, what do you hope to achieve in the next five ten years? Uh, some sanity. Uh, we're, 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 right. we're kind of busy. Uh, uh, it, it's kind of a, uh, a strange juxtaposition, the, uh, the, 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 this COVID period and the fact that we're busier than ever. But uh, Bill, why don't you pick up on that and then I'll, uh, I'll chime in. Uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, that Ian and I and, and a, a, a network and a team of other people that we uh, work with in many ways have really hit our stride here. And uh, we just love working with organizations like Lowell and Yerkes and NWA Space. And 
um, really enjoy walking with these organizations as they unfold their future, as they discover what their uh, future is and un, uh, unfold it. And I think we just want to find um, uh, really good organizations like, uh, like those ones that, uh, uh, that are fun to work with and just watch these futures unfold and, and really see how these organizations impact their communities. Yes, great. And as far as focus is concerned, um, whilst we're not wedded necessarily to the astronomy uh, space, uh, we do love working with observatories, planetariums, and astronomy. I, you know, I think Bill and I both came out of an early interest in, uh, in astronomy. Uh, I, I can trace mine back to being five or six years of age. Uh, mm. and, um, uh, and it's interesting that you made reference to uh, uh, people getting inspiration, visiting observatories and planetariums. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to see um, some sort of a longitudinal study done on this. And, and I don't think it has been actually analyzed properly, but almost any astronomer I have ever talked to, uh, any professional astronomer, if, if they get talking about their early influences, almost to a person, there was a visit to a planetarium or, or a, a public observatory, but it was right. very often a planetarium. And it might not have necessarily been a big planetarium. It might not even, even have been a very sophisticated show. Who knows? But, uh, but almost in every case that I know of, uh, that has uh, been the spark that's uh, <laughs> talking about spark. Yes. Um, that's uh, that. That's been the, the spark that set them off in in a in a certain direction. And so I, um, uh, maybe we can get an NSF grant to uh, to do a proper analysis of that. I'd like to see that happen. I'd also like to see an analysis that goes back to something that Bill was talking about, and that is uh, the effect of uh, planetariums and and public observatories on very young children. Yes. Um, uh, there are a few planetariums, the, the, uh, the small planetarium in the Ontario Science Center, uh, one at the Pacific Science Center in Seattle, one in Santa Barbara in California, and there are others uh, who have experimented with uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, who experimented with um, uh, programs for very young children. I'm talking even down to a, a year and a half to, up to the age of six. Mm -hmm. And and some of these programs are absolutely fabulous, and and uh, they 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 don't they don't worry too much about precise educa educational outcomes. They are more interested in in uh, giving the kids a positive shared experience, a shared social experience, um, uh, not to be afraid of the dark, to uh, to be just to look up um, instead of just around or or down. Um, and uh, if, if you get kids just to do that, have a happy experience singing a song under the stars or whatever, uh, some of us are absolutely and totally convinced that uh, that will have a lifelong effect. And uh, we'd like to see that more institutionalized and, uh, and recognized and lifted out and, and programmatically uh, built up as a, uh, as a mechanism within science centers planetariums and public observatories. Absolutely. I, I think that there's probably, you know, thousands of stories in LA and New York and Chicago where you had uh, uh, maybe some inner city uh, kids, maybe, uh, you know, underprivileged uh, uh, backgrounds and yeah. kind of thing where they had that one opportunity when they were very young to see this and, uh, yeah. uh, and to help them reframe what their lives could be. You know, yeah, Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about that, and uh, so does Derek Pitts, and uh, a whole bunch of people. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I hope to get. Uh, um, I, I need to reach back out to Derek. It's been a long time since I've seen him, but I'd like to get him on this uh, program as well. So, uh, uh, um, he's one of my favorite people. Really, yeah, he's really excellent. Yeah, likewise, yeah. yeah, you know, you know, Scott. Uh, I, I'm sure we have lots of amateur astronomers listening, and the work that amateurs do in yeah. outreach is so fundamental. Yeah. And so I really appreciate what Explore Scientific does to uh, promote and support that. Oh, yes, yeah. uh, sidewalk astronomy things and whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever, whatever form it takes. 
Yeah. I, I love doing uh, sidewalk astronomy myself. It's really, for me, the juice, you know. But I'll tell you, having a venue, like uh, I've done uh, astronomy outreach at Griffith Observatory. I've done it at, uh, at Yerkes Observatory, um, uh, Palomar, uh, you know, Mount Wilson, um, you know, and other observatories in this country and in other countries, too. Um, it is, uh, they are, the thing that's wonderful as someone that, uh, lo you know, someone that loves to do uh, public education and astronomy, the way that you can uh, do this on a scale that, uh, that you really can't achieve on just a street corner, you know? <laughs> yeah. When you've got this, you know, massive, beautiful uh, dome behind you and, uh, you know, they, they, they walk through, uh, uh, the observatory, and then they come outside uh, to look at maybe Saturn for the first time in their life. Yeah. You know, yeah. this kind of thing. It's just, uh, it's magic. And and the thing, the experience that you were talking about for very young children uh, and, and the effect that it has on them, there's really just pretty much one word that comes to mind for me because I had uh, experiences like that as a very young uh, person. And it's just, it just feels... It's like magic, you know, to to see the uh, the stars on the dome and and the, you know with 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 the mentor that is the person interpreting all of this, you know that that's also very critical. And I think that these facilities and the whole package really inspires people to take this up as a lifelong uh, endeavor. You know, yeah. and and if you go beyond uh, just amateur astronomy too, to extend it to people who uh, Alan, our friend Alan Dyer would appreciate this, uh, people who are engaged in photography, for instance, uh, you know, it's one thing to photograph beautiful landscapes and flowers and children, uh, but the sky is is an endless uh, thing, and the Royal Observatory in in uh, Greenwich. Uh, has an annual program of, of uh, amateur astrophotography, and and they have uh, and people can uh, join up and uh, enter into this. Uh, I, I guess you could call it a contest, but uh, lots of people get exhibited, and and it's one of the most popular shows they have when they exhibit these uh, these uh, things every November. So it's uh, it, it extends it beyond uh, the people who are already. Uh, interested or have a you know uh, predilection for interest in astronomy. Well, I I, uh, I really appreciate having both of you on. Uh, you know, I know that you're involved in all kinds of uh, programs. It seems like anytime I I call out to uh, you, Ian, you're just finishing some other Zoom meeting or some other presentation. I'm <laughs> sure that both of you are doing this all the time. Uh, I really appreciate you spent some time with us today and, and I hope to get you both back on. So there's no uh, pleasure. Yeah. There is a lot more coming up um, uh, as uh, as we're all starting to get vaccinated and uh, people are looking towards uh, getting out and traveling again and visiting the uh, very institutions that we've been talking about. So um I, I know that um, uh, I was uh, talking with uh, Tom Manigini at Mount Wilson, and uh -huh. uh, they are they are trying to figure out how to get you know what that transition is going to be like from where they are now to reinstituting all the public programs that they used to do. So uh, that's that's for another talk. Uh, I am going to send our viewers off to ianmclennan dot com. Is that right? Yes. And um, that's where you can learn more about their consulting services. And, and, and I think Bill Peters, you've got a, a website as well. Uh, oh. Yeah, uh, BillPeters.ca. In, in fact, we're so popular, I've never actually built a website that takes you to my LinkedIn page. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have an outdated website. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. It's, it's the it's it's the stuff inside that website that counts. So <laughs> I really appreciate it. It was great. And uh, I knew this would be fun. And it was. And so uh, thanks very much. And um, uh, coming up next is the 39th Global Star Party uh, that with our special guest host, Molly Wakeling. She has an incredible lineup. We have almost 20 speakers and and uh, astrophotographers that are going to be on uh, the program tonight. So 
Uh, I'm going to get some coffee and stay awake for this, uh, but uh, Molly's going to be doing the work. Um, I just make the connections. So, um, And then uh, next Tuesday, uh, April 6th, we have Chris Impe from uh, uh, University of Arizona. Uh, he'll be talking about his book, uh, Humble Before the Void, uh, where he goes to the roof of the world uh, to teach uh, Buddhist monks uh, cosmology and science. And so it's really cool. Um, and then that night on April 6th, David Levy will be our special guest host for the 40th, get it, 40th Global Star Party. So we've been, we've been doing uh, as many of uh, these Global Star Parties as we can, and, and maybe I can set a record, I don't know. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. But thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you in a couple of hours. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.